Great. So I was saying um, this talk is kind of related to the one that Alicia gave on commercial neural networks and hope you understand why really soon. And it has been prepared well with Carlos Ventura that he, maybe you want to say hi as you are already there, Carlos. Yeah, of course. Uh, hi, everyone. Yeah, I will just uh, doing the tutorial, the hands on after the, the Chavis presentation. Yeah, great. So, but actually, like uh, many of these likes, actually, they, they were prepared by, by Carlos. So you can think it's a, it's a joint presentation. So the goal of, of this uh, talk is that uh, given the tools that you have been introduced to on deep learning, how we can address one task, which is called image segmentation. Uh, we have like some, this talk from me, the introductory lecture, there you have like some hands-on with Carlos. And actually later you have uh, one lecture which uh, kind of digs in into the applications of image segmentation for medical analysis, which is one of these fields in which uh, these, let's see, neutral technologies have more applications. So let's move forward. Uh, first, I, I'm an associate professor at the University of uh, UPC University, uh, it's called the Technical University of Catalonia in Barcelona. And here you have like my contact email in case you wanna reach me later, or also I invite you to follow uh, me on, on Twitter, right? So I've been, I teach uh, this at UPC uh, quite a few bunch of courses on deep learning now, we have been uh, teaching a lot on that topic on since 2015. And I'm also a visiting researcher at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Uh, hopefully at this point you are all aware that in order to have this uh, magic deep neural networks work, it's important to have uh, powerful computations, in order to have GPUs, and that kind of uh, motivates on how my affiliation to, to this high performance uh, computation center. So in the past, I, I, I was in, in Brussels, in VUV, I worked at Sony for a year, I've been visiting Columbia University also a few times. Um, First, before I jump, I jump into the topic, uh, I would like to also to explain that uh, Barcelona, uh, maybe it's not known so far yet for the learning, but actually we have like quite a, a strong uh, tradition of, of researchers who have been uh, been educated in Barcelona. Now they are like kind of big stars on this deep learning uh, field. People like uh, Uriol Vinyals or Antonio Torralba or Laura Leal. And as we have like this uh, very powerful researchers who are abroad or in-house on deep learning, since 2018, we organized this deep learning symposium at Christmas time, in which uh, we all share experiences. Uh, you can check the videos from 2018 are there and you'll find like lots of nice talks there, if you especially if you're interested in the, in the area or investing in our country or just uh, coming to study. And uh, hopefully soon we'll have like the videos from 2019 where we had Uriol Vinyal from Google DeepMind last year as a keynote speaker. And we are uh, already planning for this year edition, which will be, that's always at the end of the year, just before Christmas time. And it all indicates that it's going to be virtual. So probably we're going to uh, follow a similar path as this summer school and make it uh, to, for a global audience. If you want to also want to learn, learn, learn more beyond this school, I invite you to check uh, all our teaching material courses we have online. We have quite a, an impressive and big uh, catalog of courses of slides, video lectures that cover uh, different aspects of deep learning. One of them is vision, and which is the one that's kind of related to this talk. But there are also like courses which are like more uh, generic, like maybe the ones we had on the first uh, day, day and a half. Of this course. We also have people who are working on speech, on natural language. Now we are, uh, we also started a course on deep learning for reinforcement learning. So we're kind of covering uh, actually like mostly the, the same areas that have been briefly introduced in this excellent uh, summer, summer virtual school that we are all attending. So you can, on the slides, you can click on all the years and you get, will access the, the, the videos. And in case you want to follow like more, uh, uh, regulated education. We also have an online program that we are launching this November uh, with researchers. Most of us, we are in Barcelona, but some of, our, of them, they are abroad. As I mentioned, some of them will be in New York, I think in Munich, uh, somewhere else. Um, uh, it's it's a, a postgraduate course that it's really oriented for people uh, to industry. So there's a lot of uh, hands-on there to learn Python. And Carlos and me are one of the instructors. Okay, I think that's all for the promotion on how, uh, why, 
explain why we, I'm here. Just also to say that both Carlos and me will um, acknowledge, like previous uh, instructors or PhD students who have been teaching this course that we are, that actually we start now. Uh, you have the videos there if, in case you want to uh, see, see it explained in a, in a different way. Let's start with the, the topic. I, I remind you that the topic of this talk is introduction to image segmentation. And the first thing we need to do is to uh, define what's the problem we are trying to, to tackle, right? Um, so far, you should have been familiar with uh, the problem of at least image classification, which means that uh, given, let's say, an image, uh, we, we want to label, want to classify that image. In this case, you have this image on the left and says you would like to have a neural network that the output will say in this image, there's a chair and there's a bin. And that's, I think you have seen uh, this kind of basic applications because that's the, the basic uh, toy example, not even toy, but the, the benchmarking that most people are, are working in, in many machine learning applications, especially using the ImageNet uh, data set. But in, in this uh, talk, in this uh, lecture, this model we have, Carlos and me are having, we're going beyond that. We are uh, going from a global scale, which is the full image, into a more local scale. Maybe you have seen uh, somewhere else, this is other application, the one in the middle, that's called object detection, okay? This, the task of object detection is a well-defined defined task for computer vision, and it, what it refers is now, the goal is not just to generate a label for the whole image, but I want to uh, pre predict the coordinates of a bounding box surrounding the object, as well as the label, right? So we want, the, 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 some, you, we want some rough localization of where the object is located. This would be the, the chair, and this would be the, the bin. On the other hand, uh, the, the task that we are addressing in this lecture, it's the one on the right, image segmentation, which means that now what we want to do is also to predict labels, but not for the whole image, not for a bounding box, but for each specific pixel on the image. So in this case, in blue, you have labeled the pixels uh, that correspond to the chair, you have uh, labeled in green, painted in green, which would indicate uh, green labels, the pixels that correspond to the bin. So this is a task, that, so we are going to address the task on the right. So in more general, uh, the, ta the goal, our task will be to try to define the accurate boundaries of objects in an image that predict a class map for each pixel. And now I will develop a bit more on this, but that's kind of the, the goal that we are trying. We would like to have neural networks that can solve these kind of problems that you see, that you could uh, draw the boundaries of the puppies and the duck and, and the cats that you see. Why is that important? So there are plenty of applications for uh, image segmentation. Uh, one of one that it's uh, capturing a lot of attention is autonomous driving, so that cars are aware of what's around them. And um, one way to do that is to label the pixels of the cameras that are sensing the or around around them. Other application that's going to be the next uh, model later, and there are plenty of them. It's medical imaging. Uh, doctors they uh, do a lot of diagnose based on medical imaging. And analyzing these images is very hard. It's very tough. It can be uh, exhausting for humans. And in this sense, uh, computers can help and assist a lot in diagnosing. And you see later uh, lots of applications for that. In that case, the classical problem is just to localize some pixels that uh, maybe they might con con uh, contain a tumor or maybe there's some small damage that you want to uh, treat. There are also applications for robotics. Uh, again, robot, robots, normally people doing robots Historically, they have focused a lot on the control part of the robot, but now as thanks to the advances in vision, now it's really, uh, we can put everything together. We can connect the control task with the vision task, everything together with uh, deep neural networks. I think that you have already had lectures on, on reinforcement learning, and that's very exciting. But still, like the perceptual and control task, they can be uh, trained at least separately, if necessary. Well, things like scene understanding, maybe you want to plan uh, how to, like furniture for your room or you want uh, yeah that's all. fine <laughs> try to figure out where you have your your phone or your keys in, in the in at home that's a kind of, of things that might benefiting of having a good computer vision solutions that can uh, localize uh, in detail the the pixels so 
based on this uh, general framework, let's start this diagram of my chalk. You'll see that there are like two big parts, uh, one that's called semantic segmentation, another one that's called insect segmentation. These are the ones, the two parts that are central for my chalk. I will first start discussing kind of a toy case, but I think it's important so that we are all get familiar with the, with the problems and challenges that we are facing. And in the end, I will briefly uh, introduce another task, which is called panoptic segmentation that you'll understand perfectly after seeing semantic and instant segmentation. So all of them, they are different flavors of image segmentation tasks. Let's start from the beginning row, from global to local scale image classification and what I mean with, with that. Here in this slide, I'm trying to show you what's the, what are, what's the problem that we are trying to solve. On the left, you have an image, still image of a lady. And what we would like to solve is what you see on the right. Maybe that's not so nice visually. For humans, it's harder to understand. But that's what, let's say, what the computer sees, right? What the machine will see. What we would like to have is uh, assign a label. In this case, labels correspond to person, force, plants, grass, sidewalk, building structures. And align each label with ideally each pixel. Uh, you'll see that now I'm, you'll see that our first iteration will not solve pixels, but almost there. But let's say that uh, like at, the, at a very local scale, I feel right what's the class that it's present there. Yeah, so it's uh, try solving a classification problem, but at a lo local scale. And I know I'm insisting a lot on that, but that's, that's, that's central for the, all this lecture, okay? We, so now we're going to call that, that we have going to have like different semantic labels. When I say semantic, I mean to the semantic class, like person, pursu, purse, uh, plants, grass, and that's what we would like to achieve. So the first uh, thing that normally deep neural networks you we struggle is how to represent information. So far, you have already seen how to represent uh, the image on the left, right? So you have seen that images in the end, you can uh, represent them or encode them as three channels, RGB, for example, and that uh, encodes the visual information. Maybe it's not that obvious how to uh, let a network encode uh, the semantic labels, the, the, the result of the segmentation task that we are trying to solve. So far, what you have seen in image segmentation, at least, sorry, in image classification, at least, is that when you have a semantic class, you can encode each, each class uh, with a one-hot encoder, uh, one-hot encoding, which means that if I have like 1,000 classes as, as an image net, I'm going to have all these zeros across all the vector, and one of the positions is going to be a one, right? And that's how, depending on the position where the one is located, that represents, in this case, the, per, the person, the purse, the plants, the sidewalk, so the semantic class. What if we are trying to solve a segmentation task? How are, how are we going to have the labels for each pixel? That's, that's not that obvious, right? Because we have like so many pixels in the image. We don't have not enough with one hot encoding. I think that this representation uh, solves our problem which kind of, as you see, what it defines is a different channel, let's call it channel, okay, uh, for each different class. And then, and then you can think that each of the, of the channels, like you have a channel for person, you have a channel for purse, for channel for plants, sidewalk, building structures, each of them, now we use zeros or ones, kind of, kind of a hot encoding dish, uh, to say whether that class uh, is present, is aligned with that, with the uh, corresponding pixels, let's say. If we have networks that at their output, they can uh, generate this type of tensors, this type of 3D uh, structures, then we are going to have uh, deep neural networks that can solve the image segmentation task. Okay, and always, uh, that's, that's kind of uh, specific or novel for, for you. Um, because I don't think I've seen any charts so far that kind of uses this kind of uh, representation. Yeah. So again, our input is going to be like, in the, in the most simple case, three channels RGB. The output is going to be a tensor with the spatial dimensions, width and height, ideally with the same dimension, the same spatial dimensions of the input image, and as many channels as semantic classes we want to label, as many different labels we have to predict. Let's proceed. So 
Okay, so now we know what we expect to have at the output. Uh, let's see how we can solve it. The first option uh, you can uh, think about, it's a very naive approach and it, and it has a big drawback, but it's, it, 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 it's possible to do that. You could say, okay, I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, take my image is from all my training set. I'm going to start defining uh, many patches. So this like a props over the image, but, but many of them all, all around the image. I will need, we are thinking about a supervised um, segmentation setup, which means that when I do my training, I will have my annotations. It means that on my training data set, I will have uh, RGB images. And also for each image, somebody will have annotated the image. So you will have labeled each pixel, whether it's a cow or it's grass, okay? We assume that we have this for training in this, for to, this lecture. Then we have both for each patch, I can uh, look at the center of the patch and say, okay, this patch corresponds to cow. And, and then I would be able to uh, generate a huge amount of patches, each of them with a, with a label, train a convolutional network, but the ones you already know about though, any, any your favorite uh, ImageNet architecture, uh, maybe I, I hope you've heard about AlexNet or maybe it's something more uh, recent like a mobile net or ResNet, whatever, one architecture that uh, has been successful for classification, the convolutional network, you train up and that, then at prediction time, at test time, what you do is, again, you have a new image, you uh, take patches of the image, you feed it through the network you have trained and at the center, so, and then you classify the center pixel of each window. And if you slide this window over the input image, uh, in the end, you will solve, you have a solution for the, for the image segmentation task that we are trying to tackle. That's, that's something you can do, okay? This is a really bad idea, actually, but it's, it's easy, but it's a really bad idea because it's uh, so demanding from a computational perspective, right? Because for each pixel, you need to uh, fit one image crop to the network. And that's going to be, take a huge amount of time. It's, it's not the best option we can think about. So one first approach to solve that, which is the, the first one that I wanna introduce, and it's more for you understanding what's going on. It's not, it's not the best solution, but it's, it's interesting to understand what's going on. It's what, what we call that we convolutionize uh, a neural net, a, a CNN, a convolutional neural network. What does it mean? It means that we're going to take uh, a CNN train for image classification, so for the whole image. And we're going to make some changes there so that um, we can fit the whole image in there. And in a single pass, it will uh, predict the labels for all the pixels. How we do that? Um, if, if you remember some of the classic, let's say at least, uh, commercial networks, uh, many of them and, not, and I, know, I know that not all of them, but this, the, the, the first ones that, that appeared, what they had is they had like some convolutional uh, layers at the beginning, and at the deepest ones, they had what they, we call fully, fully uh, connected layers or like, like the regular multilayer perceptrons. So you have neurons which are connecting with all of them. So they, they don't have these convolutional filters. And this combination, uh, it's the one that won the ImageNet Challenge in 2012 and started all, all this deep learning revolution. So the problem of these, are, of these networks is that um, what they do is they, they predict uh, at the output, they predict like kind of confidences for different classes. And now how the, the question is like, how could we use a network that it's uh, pre-trained or yeah, pre-trained uh, for image specification to solve uh, this segmentation task? So the way to do it, this convolution, convolutionization, I guess, we should call it, it's uh, to think about uh, the neurons in a fully connected, fully connected layer as if they were convolutional filters. So how, how, how to understand that? Imagine that you have uh, one neuron of a fully connected layer, in this case there are only two neurons in this layer, that the input in this case is an RGB image just to make it easier of only two per two, and then each neuron it's, it's connected to all of the um, four per three, so 12 uh, 
input pixels, right? You could, so you can think about this uh, a neural and frequency layer, but you could also think, reformulate it in a, in a same way that this actually, it's a, this neuron corresponds to a convolutional filter of this size, uh, three, three channels and two per two, okay? So then what I'm doing, but I'm just changing the, def the definition is something you can encode very easily. I'm just uh, saying that now uh, this person doesn't need, I mean, it will, it will uh, expect this um, 12 input uh, data tensor, but when I make it convolution, I can, I can move it around. I can make it as convolutional filters that are uh, in very concentrations, I can move it around the input uh, data. If we do that, and we have a neural network that I have trained for image classification. So for given as an image, a small image, okay. And I define, when I say define it, it's just that same, same parameters that I learned, I just change the definition on PyTorch or in TensorFlow and whatever and say, okay, now this, this linear layer, this fully connected layer, it's a convolutional one. I convolutionize it. Now, if I fit a larger image, the output will be also larger and will actually predict like, uh, local predictions. That's what I'm, I, I, I was think, talking about global and local scale classifications. Now, uh, I'm, I'm, in this case, I would predict a heat map. So it means like a local prediction for each different, it's not exactly a pixel, but it's something more local than not just the whole image. And that can give us an idea of more or less where the cat is predicted, is located. So it's great because if we do that, we can fit the whole image at once and we're going to have local predictions of where the cats or the cows or the grass are. Like for example, we, we ran this in, in, we had in, in our uh, university, we had a model that was predicting uh, if the if a sentiment of, of the image, if the image produced positive or negative sentiments uh, to humans. And now by doing this trick, we could have uh, on, on the row below, you can see like local predictions of positive or negative sentiments with a network that was trained at the image level, at the at image level level uh, labels we had, right? But we had here below, you, you, you see like local predictions. This is not exactly semantic segmentation, but it's getting closer to where we wanna go. Why is that? Because actually, um, as in most, Convolutional networks, there are these pooling layers that you, uh, that Alicia uh, introduced. That actually makes that if the input, it has some special resolution and there are some pooling layers in, in the network, the spatial dimension of the tensors um, will be reduced. So every time there's a, there's a pooling, uh, special pooling, the spatial dimensions are reduced. So this means that it's impossible, like if, if we only do what, what I just presented, that the, that the number of pixels that will have the input match with the number of uh, pixel-wise predictions at the output. We need, we'll need to do something else because we, we obtain some rough localizations, but, but actually if, to solve segmentation, we, we want like a one-to-one -one, uh, relation between pixels and outputs, okay? So that's, as, as I mentioned, that was like a first step so that you get start getting familiar of the kind of challenges that we are facing, but this is not a, like, a very good solution by itself to solve segmentation. But it's but it can be a, a step in the right direction, and I will develop this a bit more. So now we can jump into the the core of the talk, which are the two uh, the two main tasks in the image segmentation field, which are slightly different. One of them is called semantic segmentation here in bold, and the other one is called instant segmentation. So now what I will do is I will introduce what's the difference between semantic and instant segmentation. And then later I will go through semantic segmentation, introduce some concepts, and then instant segmentation introduce some other concepts. Okay, but first I want you to make a difference that you understand the difference between semantic and instant segmentation. So when um, we talk about semantic segmentation, the task that we are trying to solve addresses labeling every pixel. And uh, typically what you do is you uh, assign a class label to each pixel. This means that, for example, in the case of the cows, that if we label each pixel with the class cow, there is, so in the task of semantic segmentation, there is no way to make a difference between 
the different cows that appear on, on this image. Okay, so everything is blue. Yeah, the old, everything is blue. It's just cow or grass, that's all. But in semantic segmentation, you don't have the information of how many cows uh, are there in the image. This is just a, a little wise uh, pixels. On the other hand, the other task in segmentation does take that into account. In instant, in instant segmentation, what we are, what our goal is first to detect the instances. We can maybe you want to say that it's uh, objects. So we want to detect which objects appear in the image. Typically, these are the objects. We assign the category. So we say that's a in this case, this is a person, this is a person, this is a person. So we, we assign the, the category, the class, semantic class. And also we label the pixels that correspond to each of the instances. In this task, in instant segmentation, though, notice what is interesting is the black area. That there are so many pixels which are not labeled because they don't they don't contain any of the objects of any of the instances. Okay. So in this segmentation, actually, what you do is you kind of detect and segment the objects. You can think about it the other way, in the, this way. Okay. The tasks they are related. In both cases, we are generating uh, label-wise pixels. But again, in semantic segmentation, all pixels are labeled. Everything is painted in blue or green. But there's no way to differentiate between different uh, instances of the same of the of the objects of the same class. While on instance segmentation, we may have pixels which are not labeled, and but there is a way to differentiate uh, instances from the from the same class. Okay, and then um, there's a lot of words that it's important that you know which of the two tasks you are trying to address. So remember, semantic segmentation and instance segmentation. Now I will focus on solutions in the literature that have solved, have addressed the task of semantic segmentation and have provided uh, some interesting um, insights that might be useful if you are ever uh, trying to run or reproduce or design one of these models. So let's start with semantic segmentation. Again, I, I'm, I'm just repeating the same, but our goal is to have, if our EPUN has uh, height and, and weight, uh, so this height is width and three RGB channels, we are going to have predictions of height and weight and actually like as many, uh, there's, a, there's another, let's say, um, sorry, it's here. You have the, the channels here, the C here that you see that you find here is the amount of, of categories that we are going to uh, address in the, in the channel. So we have a new network that we predicted that tensor that I showed earlier. And maybe at the end, what you, if you want to assign like only one label for each pixel, you will take the maximum of the different confidences across classes, and you will have this kind of uh, nice colored uh, figure. Okay. Let's return where, where I left it a few minutes ago when I said, okay, one way to solve something similar to semantic segmentation is to convolutionize a uh, convolutional network that has been already trained for image classification. We just, in the end, it means that you have an architecture that everything is convolutional. So if we make uh, put a larger image at the input, the output is going to be larger. So it's going to give us uh, kind of a local information of, of the labels that are being predicted. Remember that I said that, that that's, so this is not solving semantic segmentation because in general, uh, convolutional networks include pooling layers that uh, decrease the spatial resolution. Okay? And, and there are some exotic architectures that don't do that, but the most successful ones, they do that. So what, what do we need to do? So actually, this is this, uh, a figure taken from one of these words that I'll be uh, citing quite frequently, which actually, they do, they, that's where they introduce this convolution, convolutionization uh, to solve the semantic segmentation uh, problem. So, uh, but they, they did uh, have this, pro this uh, limitation that when they feed the image through the network, the, the output was of, of uh, lower spatial, spatial dimension. I mean, one, one way to solve that is to do something just to rescale. So if you have a low, a small prediction in the space of, of the labels, you do um, some upsampling. Um, so this can be something as, as, as uh, simple 
maybe it's not a very good idea, but it can be just a linear interpolation and you just make things your, the, the small resolution image that you have, you just make it larger. Uh, maybe not, that's not the best thing to do, but it's, it's going to give you something. It will give you a solution, right? Um, there is, well, you can do that. Uh, you could do some uh, sampling in a linear uh, manner, but you'll see that there are other ways to do it, which are a bit better. So if you were, were paying attention uh, to Alicia's talk and you could follow it all, actually, she already introduced a solution for this problem. I mean, when we are trying to upscale the spatial dimensions, sorry, the spatial dimensions of our uh, features, of our convolutional features, there's these uh, operations, which is called transpose convolution, that actually allows that. So I'm not sure how, how much in detail she explained that, but I will just provide a, a quick overview on that, okay, and what transpose convolutions are. So just as a refresh, because probably that's something you have done, this I'm going to show first what's a tra traditional convolutional uh, two, 20, okay? So we have uh, one input for part four, and we, what we do is we, we run a convolutional filter, okay? And the uh, output of, of this uh, red filter goes into this position, then I shift the convolutional filter and the next uh, dot product, let's say, it goes into this other position. If we are considering stride one and pad one, I think that you, you have worked on this quite a lot. If I have stride two, what I do is that every time that I shift my filter, I move it two positions, okay? So one and two. And now, let's see, I, 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 that's the kind of outputs. Just notice that now the, the output, it's smaller because I'm just moving the convolutional filter uh, in a larger stride. So now I have an output of two by two, while earlier there was the output was four by four. Let's do now the transpose convolution or the convolution, which is the operation that we are interested in. Remember that our problem is that we want to upscale the spatial, the spatial dimensions of our uh, features. So now what we would like to have, have an, an input let's say of two by two, and let's see how can we have an output of four by four. If we keep working with three by three deconvolutional filters, we put our, uh, so there are some weights. So, so the filter has some weights, some parameters that are learned with, with back propagation, like the same weight as, as any convolutional filter, right? But now the weights of this uh, convolutional filter are scaled, are multiplied by the value of the input tensor. And the output, it's, yeah, it's going to be located over here should have painted it, but it should be, should be giving the value that you put here. Later, now, if what I do is I move one position, um, the, the, the blue, um, the, the three by three, the convolutional, now uh, I will have another output. So this, going, this blue filter will be uh, scaled again and weighted by the, this value, and that another value will be uh, located here. So I'm, I will be covering the, the whole uh, area, right? I will, I will be filling the, all the pixels or all the activation, the features which are below the red and blue. And in this case, they will overlap, but there's no problem. If they overlap, what I will do is I will sum uh, the overlaps. And that's how you, if, if you run these operations and you estimate the parameters for your deconvolutional filters, they are going to be optimized to solve this problem. So that was, uh, 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 an approach that was uh, suggested uh, in, in this work, in which, as you see, at first you have, uh, in, if you want to solve a segmentation task, first you have a convolutional network, and then later, so there's a bottleneck, we call it bottleneck, so actually it really goes to something very uh, small in terms of spatial definition, and now we are doing a deconvolutional network. So this unpooling, it's like, so unpooling, it's, it's, it's kind of the, so I'm pulling and convolutional filters, it's, a, it's kind of the transpose convolution in the end. And this way we have that the spatial, uh, we can recover the spatial uh, resolution of the input at the output, which is what we want here. There is a problem with this approach, actually. So with this approach, there's a problem, which is that um, maybe you are aware um, that when you train a convolutional neural network uh, for a semantic task like image classification, the deeper you go into the network, so the closer you, you are to the semantic label, 
the those filters and those uh, features they are more specialized in the in the final task in image classification let's say but remember that we are trying to solve a task which is called image segmentation and it's tr it's true that for image segmentation we need to predict uh, the label semantic label so it's great that we that we take activations from from the deep so that from the deep parts of the commercial network but we are also interested in the boundaries and the boundaries uh, of, of the objects these are small details which uh, which will be lost actually when we go deeper into the convolutional network so it's it's very difficult that only by looking at the special at the information that you have here in which you have applied different pulling operations which are uh, let's see uh, destroying the small details later in the end you 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 have the potential to reconstruct these details because in the end you, you were kind of destroying them uh, meanwhile i mean of, of course everything is learned and there's a like potential but you are making things really really hard for the network so you, you are trying to to find boundaries with uh, features that that are designed or engineered to to, de to detect semantics like faces but they are not they are not optimized to, to detect like small edges or, or the, the orientation of, of the edges. So what can we do to solve that? In order to solve that, uh, the trick here is that if we have our input image and at the output, and we have a convolutional network, so with our convolutions and our pullings and our output, um, maybe there's, um, we, we have some, so there's an output, and in, the, in this case, they were doing an, an sampling of 32 chimes, okay? So in, in this example that I'm showing, there is no, no deconvolutions, okay? So in this example, actually, if you, you see the citation, it's the one that they, they, at that point, they were not proposed the deconvolution. So it was just redoing the puddings and trying to solve uh, the semantic segmentation task. So this, this uh, special definition here is 32 times smaller than the input one. And you can train on your network with that, okay? But that's the kind of results that you obtain. Because it's, uh, so you do the upscaling, you, you take back to the original resolution, but you see it's, it's not uh, precise at all. It's, it's too coarse. So what they did is that actually, they were trying to predict uh, the segmentation mask, so the segmentation, the output, uh, segmentation, not only with this, with the features here, but also with the features, with these intermediate features, on this layer, on this other layer. And they were combining all the features. Actually, they were doing some kind of combination. So that at the end, by combining the features at the deepest part of the layer, intermediate and a little bit less intermediate, the result was much better. Okay? And it's the, we're going to call this skip connections because uh, you allow some features to skip so that the features that you compute here and you just take directly to the output they will not go through all this part of the network or you, the net features that you take here and you and you take them just directly to the output, they will not go through all these filters and, or pulling operations. This concept actually, it was later uh, um, used uh, to design one of the most influential uh, neural networks for in medical imaging and in segmentation in general, which is called the UNET, in which uh, now we are doing skipping. So we are taking features here and uh, let's say, let's say, copying them to the upscaling branch. Uh, so here, I'm, so the network now it's decreasing the spatial resolution. This will be the bottleneck, and now it's upscaling. And you here, maybe you don't see, but in white, what it's telling you, this white uh, rectangles, it's telling you that these features that you have here, you are copying them here on on, on the apps. So this downstream down this convolutional part of the network and the deconvolutional, you're copying, actually you, you, you are copying and concatenating them with the features that are come from the deconvolutional part. And this allows as the features here, they contain the small details that we need because they are at the, at the high spatial definition. When we copy them and concatenate them very so close to the output of the network, um, there is the potential, it's much easier for the network to recover the small details together with all the semantic information that's coming from the, from the branch below. So at this uh, central architecture for medical imaging, I will just move forward because probably uh, later it, it will uh, appear again with, the, with, the, with your lecture on medical imaging. Cool. Um, so skipping connections, 
or units uh, are interesting. Now I'm going to introduce uh, one more concept that helps in semantic cementation, which is related to something called receptive field. I'm not sure if somebody has talked about receptive field. I will assume not, so I will just make a, a brief uh, introduction. So the receptive field of a convolutional neural network, it, it, it refers to the part of the input data that is visible to a neuron. And when I mean a part, and now maybe I should just think about images. So when I have a, a convolutional filter that at whatever layer, so the, the features that this convolutional filter is processing, they are the results of the field of the outputs of other filters and the outputs of other filters. But in the end, at the very beginning, there's an image there. There are some pixels. So a convolutional filter at whatever uh, depth, its, its responses are related to kind of a, a receptive field that opens when you go back to the, to the image. And the deeper you go into the network, the more open the receptive field. So the more pixels it sees, okay? Um, the problem though is that with the convolutional uh, neural networks, the receptive field is not, by default, it's not infinite. So we are going to have, it's limited. We're going to have pixel-wise predictions. So uh, we're going to have, uh, we're going to see the convolutional field at some position, we'll only see one part of the image, not all of it. And this is, this may be very important uh, for cementation tasks. So uh, the, knowing where a pixel is with respect to the whole context, that can be very helpful. Like knowing if, if, if you, maybe you will not predict a uh, pixel of an elephant if, you, if everything around it is snow because it's really red, right? You have never seen an elephant in, in, in the snow. So having a, a, a wide receptive field, so when, a, when your conventional filter must make a prediction, if you can see larger part of the image, that's, willing, that's probably going to help. This is related, and again, I'll take another slide from Alicia, with what she presented on dilated and atrous convolutions, which are these uh, convolutions with, with holes, atrous means like with holes, that actually their, their, their goal is to increase the receptive field of the, of the, of the commercial uh, network as you go deeper into the, the network. So, and it's great because if you add more layers, you know, so the deeper you go into a neural network, and if you are using dilated or atrous convolution, it's, it's the same, okay? The receptive field grows exponentially, it means like in how you open the, the beam of, of the image, the, the part of the image that you, that, that uh, filter at that position sees, but uh, the number of learnable parameters grows linearly. So it, it's, it's very useful, especially, uh, for segmentation tasks. I think Alicia also mentioned that. And here you kind of see uh, on blue, on dark blue, you kind of see like uh, the, the shape of an atrous convolutions and how it, it, it's uh, more, more open than the activation part that you see on, on green. Okay, so I think these are like all the basic tools that I wanted to introduce. And if you start combining uh, these deleted Atrous convolutions with something else, which is called spatial pyramid pooling, which which is is related, it's not exactly, but it's related to the to have to being able to have features from different uh, depth of the of the network. Uh, then you have that was the 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 building box blocks of uh, popular uh, architecture, which like uh, PSPNet, just go hidden, but PSPNet that's the model that you see there and solves a cementation. And very famous, it's DeepLab. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different versions of DeepLab. Uh, the last one is DeepLab V3, which is very popular on, on writers on all these uh, models, which in it's combining special pyramid polling that I didn't have time to explain. Uh, this encoder decoder in the sense of convolutional deconvolutional and the others convolutions. So if you put everything together, results are pretty good at a pretty double computation. Okay, I will start. The, the last part, the, this last part, it's, it's uh, smaller than, than the first one, which is instant segmentation. So all the, all the techniques that I presented, they were proposed with semantic segmentation tasks, but they are also useful for instant segmentation. Okay, so it's, uh, they were proposed for the, for the task uh, above, but you will also see them in solutions addressing the task of instant segmentation. Remember that instant segmentation 
it's again, uh, we want to detect the objects and, and find the boundaries of the objects. So this field uh, is greatly influenced by another task that I introduced at the beginning, which is called object detection, which uh, remember was drawing bonding boxes around the, the objects. And it's very related because in object detection, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, so the examples now are on object detection, but they are, it's kind of the similar problem. Remember that in segmentation means like I detect the object and now I segment it. As I first need to detect the object, it makes sense that uh, literature has, has been highly influenced by, by solutions targeting the object detection task, which is having the bonding box only. So many solutions of, on object detection what they have done is they, they have an image, they do something which called object proposals, which says, okay, I think that all these bounding boxes, they might be, they might uh, correspond to puppies and cats, okay? And then you have many uh, candidates, you rank them, okay, based on some confidence metric. And in the end, what you do is you discard all the candidates that you don't, that you are not interested. So if, if you say, okay, so in this example, I found like two dogs, but I will apply, you apply something called no maximum suppression, which basically means that if you have two candidates that overlap a lot of the same class, uh, you just keep the, the one that, that has the highest confidence score, but the network is most, is most confident about. And in this case, it would discard this candidate. So it would detect only one dog. In the example, it has also has detected two cats and it would uh, discard this, this cat because the confidence, this value here is it's lower. It's called the no maximum suppression. And there are so many solutions there that have uh, based on this. And actually later, Carlos will talk about it. Um, if you solve this part of uh, having the object proposal, it means that you already have a bonding box over the image. Then uh, from there, you can extract the max on the bonding box. But it's kind of a, these are like two stages, right? First, I detect the object and then I extract the max. And later you will be uh, using that for the, the hands-on with, with Carlos Ventura. So um, there have been approaches trying to combine these bonding boxes and, and mask. Uh, that was the, the first one that was proposed. But I'm very interested in, in briefly commenting this, but later Carlos will talk more about this, but uh, that's the one that's very similar to what you will be doing. So this is a solution for object detection. So the outputs are uh, bonding boxes. What you have is you encode an image, you have a, a network that makes proposals, object proposals, and then for each proposal, uh, what you do is you uh, generate class properties for each proposal, right? So you you for the proposal, uh, so which are, what what is the class that is shown in, in this bounding box? And but you have kind of another network that that addresses this. I think I will let Carlos to explain this better um, because otherwise I would run out of time. With Carlos, actually, you will be uh, using uh, an approach that's using this scheme, okay? That's called Mascar CNN, which for each of these uh, proposals, it will, it will have a generate a feature map of fixed dimensions for which you will predict the class, you will improve the bounding box, and you will also generate the, the, the mask, the chair mask as well. Yeah. Okay, I think I will let I will let Carlos you if you need to explain more. I will skip this once so I don't run out of time. These are results that you can obtain with Mascar CNN, which is a very popular model that you can find in all the libraries. So um, one one of the problems of these proposal based methods is that um, if two objects are really overlapping uh, a lot, uh, the no maximum suppression step will uh, remove it, uh, you will need to engineer, decide some threshold for the non-maximum suppression. Uh, the same pixel can be assigned to multiple instances. And the number of predictions is kind of limited to the number of proposals, which is another parameter, which is handcrafted. Um, there are some other object detection solutions, which are called a single shot, in which you don't, they don't have the proposals. And so people have tried to, to explore uh, with these single shot proposals. There's one called RetinaNet. And then again, you have the modding box here, and then you, you generate mask for each of the bounding boxes. And also just very briefly in our uh, lab, what we did is um, 
So we kind of extended the idea of uh, image classification. So you have you you saw yesterday with Alfredo that there are these networks called charcoal recurrent neural networks that allow uh, working with sequences. So imagine that in this image you could uh, process it and say there's a cat, there, there's the grass, and there's stone here below, but as a sequence of an RNN. And we proposed a solution that was uh, that was capable of kind of reasoning. Uh, on, over the image because it would say, okay, so I have my image. I predict that there's a bike here. That's the smell of the bike. And now that I know that this is a bike, I think that this is a dog and that's it. And there's nothing else like the stop board when you are doing translation. So we, we solved the segmentation task with a recurrent uh, strategy. We were not the first ones, but that's another approach that you can, you can try. Okay, I will just conclude with this idea of monotic segmentation, uh, which is this third task that I mentioned that I wanted to comment, which in the end, it's, it's as simple as uh, when somebody's talking about quantum segmentation, it means that it's trying to address both tasks, the semantic and the instance segmentation task. It means that, uh, and you can have networks like uh, this one, that it's solving uh, both tasks. You, you have, uh, so you, you extract your features with a pyramid or whatever, and then you have a, what they call a semantic head in which uh, solves the semantic segmentation task and the instant head that solves the instant segmentation task. And as everything is trained uh, end to end, the network uh, learns to solve both, both tasks at, at the same time. Um, yeah, so I think that will be it from my side. If there are, this is still a, an active field, so you can check latest words that I have put here from the last year. And if you want to play with that, there are some data sets that I, uh, we listed here in case you are more you're interested. Um, yeah, just to conclude, also if you want to know more about our research, I invite you to click on these links and maybe check out what we are doing. And you'll see also that there are like some opportunities for, for basically public grants to apply for them. If you have good uh, student profile, uh, and you are interested in our research, or we'll be happy.